Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Do you like magic? Are you intrigued by magical tricks, mysterious powers and love Harry Potter? Do you use divination to predict the future and clarify the past? Do you talk to your spirit guides or your loved ones on the other side? Well, if you do, you are not alone. While magic is fascinating, intriguing and fun, I'd like to talk about the concept of magic beyond the fun and entertainment and explore it as the invisible cosmic energy we can use in ways that defy logical explanation or, to be more precise, have defied for centuries up until now. To unravel the mystery of magic, sitting right at the intersection of science and spirituality, I have invited a top-notch expert in this field. According to him, magic is a natural aspect of reality, a power accessible to anyone with focus and practice, and the phenomena known as extrasensory perception or ESP, such as telepathy, clairvoyance and psychokinesis, have a solid scientific basis. My special guest today is Dr. Dean Radin. Dr. Radin is the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, researcher and best-selling author and co-author of over 40 books, including Real Magic, which we will talk about today. Dr. Radin has four degrees, a master's degree in electrical engineering focused on cybernetics, honorary doctor degree in yoga research, and a PhD in psychology. Alongside his scientific pursuits, he became interested in parapsychology and worked as scientist on a secret U.S. government program conducting research on psychic phenomena. Dr. Radin was featured in a New York Times magazine article in 1996 and has been interviewed by every major broadcast channel in the U.S., many of the cable channels and streaming services. He has participated in over 40 TV and film documentaries and has been a consultant for a number of feature films with psi-oriented themes. And now, Dr. Radin joins me from the foothill of the Rocky Mountains in the American Northwest in Idaho. Hello, Dean. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Okay, let's talk magic. And to take us there, could you please briefly share with us how did you get interested in parapsychology and psychic phenomena to the point of becoming a world-class expert in this field? I read a lot of science fiction as a child and a lot of fairy tales. And I always wondered whether those kinds of stories were simply fantasy or wish fulfillment or whether there was any truth to it. Uh, And so I think ultimately it was really just curiosity, right? A lot of kids end up reading Harry Potter or the equivalent or science fiction. Mm -hmm. And some part of yourself begins to wonder after a while that these 
topics are so common in the entertainment world that uh, is it simply a matter of we we wish we had these abilities or is there any truth to it? And so one of the things I learned along the way was uh, after also reading a lot within the the mystical literature and the literature of yoga and meditation is that in those in those contexts, these kinds of abilities were not considered fantasy. They were real, real stories of apparently real things. So again, my curiosity was piqued by reading literature from a different culture, not Western culture, mostly Eastern, mm -hmm. and wondering, well, you know, it would be really amazing if those things were true. And so as a teenager, I discovered that there was a discipline of science that had been looking at these kinds of phenomena since the late 1800s. And even more interestingly, that the, the evidence even up to that point, by about 50 years after the 1800s, the evidence was already pretty good that some of these phenomena were actually true. And so, again, my curiosity was uh, even enhanced more by seeing that there's an enormous amount of lore, but there's also some science that has been brought to bear. So you don't have to accept anything on faith. You can actually test it. And so I decided that if it was possible to work as a scientist in that domain, that that would be what could be more interesting than that. Absolutely. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. <laughs> and and you are today a, a world-renowned scientist and researcher and expert in this field. The dictionary definition of magic is the power of apparently influencing events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. What is magic from your perspective, and uh, and what does it have to do with consciousness? So the way I think of it is uh, that in today's modern world, we uh, look at the scientific worldview as a way of simply understanding how things work. So it's materialism. It's it, and we know that it works. Our technologies are based on that worldview, and it allows us to do an interview at the opposite ends of the earth through a technology that we're using. So we, we like to think as modern and sophisticated people that our worldview is 100% correct, but it isn't. No worldviews are 100% correct. And in particularly in science, there are lots and lots of puzzles of things that we don't understand. Like we don't understand where consciousness come from, uh, does the brain create it? Is it already there? These are outstanding problems of which we have no solution. So that that caused me to start thinking about, well, what other worldviews have there been in history? Well, the one that's been around the longest is called now called the esoteric worldview. It's a worldview that has been around from shamanism up to the present day, but it is called esoteric now because it's been pushed aside by science. It's it's esoteric meaning hidden, but it's not really hidden. I mean, there's plenty of books out there you can read about this stuff. <laughs> so if you take that worldview and you, in, and you look at what's, what's called a perennial philosophy to see, well, what's common among all of these different esoteric ideas, the underlying similarity is that uh, consciousness is fundamental. That it doesn't arise from anything. It's simply part of the fabric of the universe. It's there in the same way that, that energy is here and matter is here. It's fundamental in that sense. But it even goes beyond that because most of the, of the esoteric traditions say that consciousness is more fundamental than the physical world. So a philosopher would say this is idealism. It's one of the ways of thinking about the nature of reality. So from an idealistic perspective, the physical world emerges out of consciousness. And if you think about it, it, it turns out that the only thing that we can know directly, first person, is our awareness. It's consciousness. Yeah. From that perspective, everything known in science is an inference. Like there is no direct knowledge of anything in science. It's all an inference based on our interpretation, our subjective interpretation of measurements and things that we come up with. So, so you can then you can recast the notion of modern science based on materialism as a special case. It is a special case. It's, it's a, a perfectly valid worldview. 
we don't need to throw away anything we understand about science, but it's a special case in the same sense that classical physics is a special case of quantum physics. Quantum physics is a more comprehensive way of understanding the nature of reality. Classical physics works in certain contexts really well. We were able to go to the moon and back using classical physics, but it's not the end of physics. By the same token, materialism as a way of understanding reality is a special case, it, but it doesn't describe everything. Whereas idealism, or in general, the esoteric way of, of uh, understanding reality is simply a more comprehensive way of including everything, including consciousness. And th this is important because from a, from a, a scientific worldview, we can't account for consciousness. It's outside of this worldview. And that's one of the reasons why topics like real magic, psychic phenomena, even mystical experiences are considered to be so controversial because people would say, a conventional scientist would say, well, that stuff's all fantasy. It can't possibly be true because it's not accounted for by science. Mm -hmm. not realizing that science does not account for everything. <laughs> There's something bigger than that. So the my, the point I'm making then in, in my book, Real Magic, is that if you, if you then just reframe science as a special case that works really well for the material world, there are other ways of thinking about what's going on, which are actually an expansion of science. And that would require something like like idealism or some other philosophy, which is bigger and more comprehensive than materialism is. And when you do that, you suddenly find that ideas of mysticism, magic, psychic phenomena, all of them become very easy to understand. Whereas from a strict scientific viewpoint, they're actually very, very difficult to, to understand to the point where many scientists would say that it doesn't exist at all. Absolutely. And you made a very important point, which caught my attention uh, when you said that esoteric experience or esoteric knowledge is the only real experience that we can have. And all scientific evidence, quote unquote evidence, is inference because we, we simply cannot experience it directly, which I think is the point that quite often escapes yeah. from the narrative of esoteric knowledge versus scientific evidence. So, so thank you for pointing this out. And I call this space, if you like, of knowledge and experience an intersection of science and spirituality. It is so elusive, it is very difficult to pinpoint, mm -hmm. but as you have elaborated in your book, and we are coming closer and closer to understanding more of that mysterious dimension, which can be looked at from both and either science and spirituality. Absolutely. Well, so the beauty of science is that it is an open system. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not dogmatic. I mean, sometimes scientists will speak in a dogmatic way, but that's mostly arrogance from my perspective. So the open nature of science means that we're, we observe the world as it is, we try to come up with models and ways of testing what we think we understood. And so science as an evolving system, I think, is converging towards the experience that people have, which they describe as spiritual. And eventually, science will expand. It will become more comprehensive. And, and if we're really lucky, it will provide some kind of rational explanation for these kinds of experiences that people have. If it's not the science of today. It might not be the science of 100 years from today, but the direction that we've been moving for the last 500 years, I think, is is on a, I wouldn't want to, want to say a collision course, but it's on a converging course. Mm -hmm. In your book, you talk about the four key, ele or the three key elements of magic as in this context, mm -hmm. divination, force of will, and theurgy. Could you please speak to this and explain what do you mean by that and how we can look at it? Divination is 
perception through space and time. So when you read about uh, stories that have magical elements or movies that have magical elements, one of the stereotypes is uh, is a fortune teller looking at a crystal ball. So this is all about perception through space and time. The, the other aspect of it is when uh, you pick up a grimoire, which is a book of spells, that is all about manipulation of the physical world. And sometimes you can think of it almost as destiny engineering. You're you're trying to engineer your destiny to be one way versus another way, and you need to manipulate the world. And the third category is theurgy, which again, from the stereotype, is uh, people in in uh, dark robes with hoods and doing some kind of a ritual to evoke spirits and and do something with spirits. So those are the three categories of traditional magic. Uh, all of them, as as I already said, are is it just saturate our entertainment. So it's a part of the popular culture that these kinds of phenomena, we, we just enjoy it, I suppose. Uh, and those those then are the three areas where science has been able to do controlled testing to see whether, in principle, these kinds of phenomena could be true. So I, I emphasize in principle because we can't tell from anecdotes, and we certainly can't tell from stories whether these phenomena are real. Uh, so we have to go into a controlled environment, like a laboratory environment, to test these effects and see whether we can show that after we exclude all of the human biases and frailties and mistakes and all the rest of the things that can go wrong, do you still end up with positive evidence that something like telepathy or clairvoyance or, or psychokinetic effects, is it actually demonstrable in the laboratory? And the short answer is, yeah, it is. So this is how we know that in principle, magical practices that have been around since humanity was crawled out of the ocean, these are real effects. They are nowhere near what you see in, in entertainment, but it should not be surprising to anybody that what we see in entertainment is an elaboration of what goes on in the real world. If it was completely alien to, to our normal experience, we wouldn't, we wouldn't resonate with the story. You know, we, we want stories that we can feel like we can put ourselves into the story. If something is so alien that it is completely outside of our experience, we would not resonate with it and we wouldn't find the story very interesting. So the, I, I think I thought of this many years ago that the reason why mythology and parables and stories and movies and television shows, the reason why people are gravitate to it is because there's some element of truth in it just like there is in mythology. Yeah. But it's a, it's presented in a way which is not scientific, but nevertheless a way that we can recognize that oh that 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 looks that looks like it might be real. And even better, many many people have had experiences like this. They might, they might call it a synchronicity, uh as simple as something like a deja vu, but a lot of people have had precognitive dreams and other kinds of experiences. So these kinds of stories are not actually so strange. To the average person. Uh, and again, that's one of the reasons why we like to watch them. Absolutely. I would like to take the concept of force of will a bit further and ask you, does it include the modern, if you like, take on the power of thought, emotion, and intention being energy that we project and um, other people can receive. Is it the same concept or does it fall within the same concept of the force of will in your view? Yeah. So force of will is through uh, the projection of attention and intention. It's modulated by belief. It's also modulated by your ability to imagine. So it's all mental stuff, but it, it, uh, it is, it's, Primarily, I think, uh, a matter of attention and intention. So you can't have intention without some attention to something. You need to, to attend to something. Uh, and our research uh, and those of my colleagues suggest that attention alone actually has a measurable effect. Intention 
can spin it in a sense, metaphorically, you can take something and, and cause mm-hmm. it to be slightly different than it would otherwise. But only attention, focused attention seems to have an effect as well. The observer effect. Well, that's how it is perceived in quantum mechanics. But, it, you know, and yeah, in our experiments, it seems to work in macroscopic uh-huh. systems too. Fascinating. So we could say that what superstition, curses, black and white magic, witchcraft, shamanism, and positive affirmation have in common is that they all work with energy, the unseen stream of consciousness we can all tap into. Would you agree? I would agree, except that I would put the word energy in quotes. Because when you mention words like force, energy, resonance, frequency, all of those words that are commonly used in this Mm -hmm. domain, for an engineer or a physicist, they have very precise meanings. Okay. Or for someone who is not in engineering or physics, it has it, you you can use it as a metaphor or maybe even an analogy, but it creates confusion. So I talk about energy as well, uh, but I, I usually put it in quotes to to indicate that I mean that it's not energy like a physicist might talk about energy. It's more like felt energy. Oh, okay. It's like an internal sense of of aliveness or something like that. Okay. So do you prefer to use the word consciousness or is it again, somewhat different concept? Well, we don't really know what consciousness is either. So you know, the words begin to fail when trying to get down into the details of what's going on. So I will use the word consciousness as a synonym for awareness, but it's a lot more than that because, I mean, when you think about uh, consciousness The model of it, which is probably correct, I think, is like an iceberg. So there's you have your conscious awareness, which is the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of it is below the ocean. And one thing that we know about psychic phenomena is that these abilities bubble up from the unconscious. It's it's very rare that somebody can be fully conscious, fully consciously aware of psychic phenomena and use it at that level. Most of it is unconscious. So is the unconscious part of consciousness? I guess. I mean, it's it's something about our awareness. And for long-term meditators and people involved in yoga, uh, they will find after an enormous amount of practice that they have more and more access to what would normally be thought of as their unconscious. Mm. So you can become more and more aware of this larger iceberg of consciousness. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Even, even down to the point with very advanced meditation of recognizing that all there actually is, is consciousness. Yeah. And so people who have that experience we call mystics because their experience is they are one with the universe. So from any conventional point of view, that doesn't make any sense to say that. What do you mean you're one with the universe? They're saying that their awareness encompasses the entire universe. So if we agree that our intention, our attention, thought, emotion, which are the elements of that, carry information which impacts on the physical reality, on the material world, often instantaneously, isn't the creation a giant quantum holographic computer? Are we all living on a holodeck? <laughs> well, that is one of the prevailing models of what's going on. Uh, can we, uh, I, I don't think we actually know anywhere near enough to know what is actually happening. But as a metaphor, yeah, it's a popular metaphor because we sort of understand computers and we're beginning to understand quantum computers. We know about holograms. The, all of those metaphors put together sound like, yeah, okay, it could be something like that. But as I said, I suspect it's way more complicated than that. In fact, it may be more complicated to the point where humans cannot know. We we can't know enough because ultimately it's consciousness trying to understand itself. And when you have a system that's trying to encompass itself, it, it's a paradox. You can't do that. So we can get closer and closer to it, but we probably can't know it directly except maybe if you had a mystical experience. Yeah. But the nice thing about a mystical experience is you ask somebody who has that experience, well, tell me what it was like. 
And the answer is it's ineffable. I can't yeah, yeah. because I don't have language for it. Yeah. So this, this is going to be a problem for a long time where we do, yet don't have even the concepts or the language to be able to describe what we're talking about. Yes, absolutely. Just like we still can't define or even understand the concept of God or whatever the name you know you, you may choose to to use mm-hmm. for that you know the creator the 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 uh, supreme intelligence we can talk around it we can we can try to to describe the experience but we can't actually grasp it intellectually and yeah. put it in words it said okay oh, this is that or this is yes yeah we anthropomorphize things like like concepts like God. And it's easy for us to picture the the man with a beard somewhere up in the clouds because we're familiar with that. But what is actually going on is undoubtedly much more complex and probably much more interesting too, right? The, the, <laughs> a, a universal intelligence of some type is not going to be humanoid, among other things, because we're a very specific kind of creature that has evolved to in this on this planet so we've been shaped by evolution to be this way but there's an infinite number of ways that that a that a consciousness can probably be including things like a giant gas bag out in space and you know maybe a whole a whole constellation of planets can be conscious who knows yes and by the way you said something which i thought was interesting you said uh, that ultimately what's going on here is a a, uh, a sharing of information. Now, I wouldn't use the word transfer, but it has to do with information. And information is really interesting because it is carried by energy, It is, but it's not energy. It's a non-physical thing. Yeah. It's it's a description of something. And so one of the ways I I try to describe to people of why information is so important and could have gigantic physical effects is if you whisper in somebody's ear, I love you, you'll get a certain physiological response. If you whisper to the same degree of energy, you're going to prison. That will have a very different kind of response. So the energy involved is the same, but the physiological response, which has to do with the meaning associated with the information is drastically different. So take that example, and now you you can see how something like a psychokinetic effect or force of will, if you trans if if you send tra- sending and transmitting are not the right words, but I don't know what else to use. If information somehow gets to some other system, a physical system, and it's simply informational, and you're changing something about the informational structure of that physical system, you can make all kinds of interesting things happen without energy. It's like using the energy of the physical system itself. It's inherent energy is is enough. And so there an example is you can describe uh, like a can of soda sitting on a table in terms of the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions is like a physical physics concept where you're describing, well, why is the can just sitting there? So if you think about it, on top of the can is miles of atmosphere. So there's an enormous amount of weight actually pushing down on the can. And the same like with us, it's gravity pushing down. Mm -hmm. If you're able to change even a tiny little bit of the description of of all of these environmental aspects around the can and just slightly reduce the the amount of, of atmospheric pressure on the top of the can, it would get launched into orbit. (laughs) <laughs> because it's no longer being held in the in the way that we would normally see. So that uh, how do you do that? How would you change the informational structure? Well, we you can do it through magical methods, but in physics at this point, we don't really know, with one exception. The shape of an airplane wing. That's what it does. The shape of an air, airplane wing will cause a small vacuum on the top. It will reduce the amount of pressure on the top of the wing, and that's why it goes up. So we know a little, we know something in science about how to do these kinds of effects, but to do it in a magical way requires something completely different. 
Mm. Apparently, there are people, perhaps a handful of people in the world, who can levitate. There are claims. How do they do that? There are claims. Who claim and maybe have been seen to levitate. Is it possible? One time I I was at the... uh, the Transcendental Meditation University, which is in the state of I- Iowa in, in the United States. Uh, and I was going to see a demonstration of yogic flyers. So one of, one of the things, you know, with like a famous thing from the TM uh, Meditation Society was that they were promoting the idea of do the yoga, yoga city program and you would learn how to fly. Well, that would, that sounded good. So I was a a small group with a small group of people who were going to watch the best yogic flyers in the world. And what I saw was that there were four young men and they were hopping. They were were in full lotus position and they were hopping, which is not that easy to do in a lotus position. But nevertheless, they were hopping pretty good, two to three feet, which is an amazing athletic feat. Uh, But were they flying? Well, the answer is no. And I, I asked at the time the leader of the Transcendental Meditation Society, has anybody ever hovered, which would require a true form of levitation? And the answer was no. Mm. So as best as I can tell, and I've heard st- certainly stories and there's videos of people supposedly levitating, I would love to test somebody who is really supposedly able to do this, but so far I've never seen anything that I consider to be credible. Mm. That doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means that from the point of view of getting credible evidence for yeah. levitation, that it so far it's been elusive at best. Yes, very interesting. Could you please speak for a moment to the nexus of science, religion, spirituality, and magic? How do they all converge and is there other other intentions? Well, mysticism is the source of religion. It's it's a first person experience. Uh, somebody has the experience. They try to convey it to other people. People will resonate with it because there are aspects of it that sound correct. Unfortunately, religion very quickly turns into dogma, and so traditional religions uh, I don't pay too much attention to because as a dogmatic system. It, it by definition means it's not going to change, and and there's a, and there's layers upon layers of additional dogma that happened over the over time, and it becomes a sociological and power issue much more than the the raw mystical experience. So, what is spiritual experience then? Is in the very simple sense, it's a sense that there is something more than everyday experience. There's something that transcends. Our, our everyday experience and would be perceived as connections through space and time. That's part of what people talk about as a spiritual experience. You're feeling expanded in space and time. You feel bigger, something bigger and, and more intelligent, perhaps, around us all the time. So that that's kind of what what most people, I think, mean by spirituality if they were to deconstruct the actual term and the experience. The science side is, uh, science is quite good at describing aspects of the physical world, and there is an overlap. So if somebody has a spiritual experience where they feel connected with somebody at a distance, so we use a label telepathy or some other label like that, is to, to suggest that the, the experience of that connection at a distance uh, internally might feel quite much, very much like a transcendent experience. You're transcending your local physical self and somehow feeling or being with somebody at a far distance. So science can study that experience. So that's where science comes into play because the experience is described. Two people are separated at a distance. Can they actually communicate in any way, physiologically, consciously, whatever? Is that possible? So that becomes a classic experiment in parapsychology. And there's tons of evidence going back at least in from the, about the 1880 or so to the present day, showing that that experience can be seen in the laboratory. It's usually not anywhere near as strong 
as a, like a true mystical experience, but it can be measured nevertheless. And we see it in physiology, we see it in brain activity, we see it in conscious reports. So the the experience, which would be called spiritual by some people or psychic by others, we can confirm that using the tools of science. Unfortunately, we don't have yet a very good scientific explanation for why this happens other than showing that uh, the uh, quantum entanglement looks very much like these, these kinds of experiences because it's about connectedness through space and time. So I think what we can say then is that physics has evolved to the point where we know that the physical world can support these kinds of phenomena. The underlying mystery then still unresolved is, well, why do we experience it from an, from an internal sense? It's like our, our subjective sense of awareness is physics from the inside. And science looks at physics from the outside. Well, there's always an inside and an outside to everything, and they're <laughs> deeply related then. So yeah. one of the, the philosophies that actually is relevant here is called dual aspect monism. The monism is saying there's really just one thing, but there are different aspects of it that we can perceive. So in mind and matter in, within this philosophy are like two sides of the same coin. The coin is the one thing. The mind is one is like the heads and matter is the tails. They're very tightly correlated with each other. In fact, you can't just have a heads without a tail or vice versa. They're, they're both necessary for this one thing to exist. And so the interesting thing about dual aspect monism is that, well, what connects the mind and the matter? It's meaning. Meaning connects it. Well, meaning and information are very closely related to each other. And what does the mind do? The mind is a meaning machine, kind of, right? We, we create meaning mentally. Mm -hmm. And that then seems to be the connection between mind and matter. Yes. And it's, and it's non-local. It does the mind and the matter yeah. don't need to be in the same space time. They could be separated at opposite ends of the universe and it would still work. Is the world of science ready? to embrace magic as a spiritual phenomenon and vice versa is the world of spirituality with their practitioners ready to look at magic and accept magic as a scientifically explainable phenomenon. So the point of my question is the gap between science and spirituality in relation to magic, is it narrowing or is it still fairly wide because either side is not quite ready or willing to embrace the other? That's a very good question. And, and so I would say that uh, the gap is narrowing. There's still an enormous amount of resistance in the academic world because the academic world is based on ideas. It's all about ideology. Each discipline is its own little silo and it has its own worldview and it's very difficult to get people within one silo to talk to the people in the next silo. So in general, uh, within the academic world, it's very, very difficult to, to uh, talk about these topics, including in publishing in journals. There's a lot of resistance because it pushes against the status quo. In, in any context, if you push against the status quo in a social context, political, whatever, you get a huge pushback because people don't want to see things change. In fact, one of the most common responses that I, I hear about these phenomena is, uh, first, there's no evidence. There's no scientific evidence. Well, that's just an expression of ignorance because there's an enormous amount of evidence. Also, for some reason, maybe lay people think this, but scientists also think that, that every scientist knows everything about everything, <laughs> which is ridiculous. I mean, if I pick up a journal article on some topic I don't know, I can't get past the abstract. I can't even understand it. 
<laughs> so the, the the idea that you would ask a conventional physicist, you know, do you think, is this possible? Is this telepathy thing real? They would say, no, there's no evidence in any way. It's impossible. And then the next question you should ask is, well, what, what literature have you read? <laughs> and if you're really lucky, they will have read at least one article, but usually they haven't read anything. <laughs> if they read an article and they still dismiss it, then it, it partially is going to be arrogance, of course. But uh, typically it's because they don't want to understand it. They don't want to have to believe it because of this underlying fear. Yes. I see this in academics a lot. There is a fear that things that I have spending my life on are not completely true. Yes. And nobody, not only academics, nobody wants to be put into that case because our ideas and our identity are closely linked. So if somebody comes to you and says, you know, you really, really strongly believe this thing, and there's really good evidence that that's actually not true, that feels like a personal attack. And so the response is not one of a rational thing saying, oh, tell me more about it. The response is an emotional response of anger. Yes. And I've seen this again and again. So it's so I recognize it. I sympathize with it. It took me years of, of doing many, many tests of these kinds of phenomena to get to the point where I was willing to accept it because I didn't come at this topic because I believed in it. I don't really believe in anything other than my own experiences, right? So my experience then says in lots of laboratory tests that you can do these experiments, you can get results which are compatible with, with the idea that these phenomena are real. And it doesn't bother me that way. I don't have a good explanation for it. It does bother a lot of scientists. Science should be a matter of observing and testing, and then you develop a theory. But the reality of it is that a lot of scientists require an explanation first in order to accept an observation. And the history of science is full of examples where things that were quite real and observed many, many times were simply dismissed. So the, the, usual, the usual examples of this are things like meteorites. So in the 17th century, people had been reporting rocks falling out of the sky. And so the French Academy at the time was the, the premier science of the day. And they said, that's impossible. You can't have rocks falling out of the sky because there are no rocks in the sky. Well, it took a long time to finally admit after telescopes and understanding the universe a little better that, yeah, there are rocks in the sky and occasionally they fall down. But that it took a long time. And it, there are many examples like this where observations were repeatedly reported by independent people over long periods of time, which were totally dismissed. And then later, only much later, after we had better ideas about what we're dealing with, did people say, oh, well, okay, meteorites are real. Ball lightning is real. Uh, vitamin C stops scurvy. On and on and on. Lots of, lots of examples like that. Mm. So I think we've got a strong case here for a, well, for a desired, if not required, evolution of science to shift it from the ego base of fear, anger, to an open mind. I mean, it, it sounds very simple and very logical and the right way to go. But we are all humans and <laughs> people have egos and people have invested a lot of time and money and energy uh, and their life on pursuing a certain uh, pathways of thinking and research. And so, yes, as you've said, it is difficult, but just like we need, which we are going through, by the way, we need to go through a spiritual evolution in terms of our society, you know, the humankind, in order to be able to access those higher levels of experience and understanding of the cosmos, if you like. I feel that equally, we need to have a sort of evolution or transformation or opening of science for it to be ready to embrace those esoteric and spiritual concepts in order to get to the next levels of understanding what it can measure. Yes. No, I agree. 
And so I'm optimistic that uh, th that the gap is closing and that people are becoming more open. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the number of conferences on consciousness, 30 years ago, there were very, very few. The only people who attended that were philosophers interested in the mind-body problem. Today, you could find such a conference almost every day around the world somewhere. That means that there's, there's an opening to studying a fundamental puzzle, the puzzle of consciousness from many different disciplines. The neurosciences are doing it, physics does it, scholars do it, there's lots of stuff. And at the same time, maybe coincidence, but I don't think so, is a rise in a, re a renewed interest in psychedelics. Yes. Because one of the things that happens, one of the correlates of psychedelics is you blast your mind into some other place and what's very strongly correlated with that are, are psychic abilities. In addition, now it is, well, 30 years ago, meditation was considered a an exotic, weird thing that only strange people did. Yeah. And now it's pretty much mainstreamed. So you have from many different directions, this notion that uh, maybe we didn't quite understand consciousness very well before, but we're beginning to approach it from different directions some science, some scholarship, some from the, the lay public. And it is opening our minds, so to speak, to be more open to these kinds of things. You, you still find a lot of resistance within fundamentalist religion, even though fundamentalist religion completely accepts magic. They just don't like anybody practicing it except them. <laughs> you, you find resistance yeah. in the academic world for reasons we already talked about. You also find resistance among politicians, and among business people, even though they might use these things themselves. And the reason is that if, just to give one example, if telepathy were real, it means there's no secrets. <laughs> and you can't have politics and you can't have business without secrets. It would also change the whole legal system. Yes. And so you're pushing against the status quo there, which is extremely strong uh, and part of civilization. So Imagine a civilization that was completely open to these kinds of yes. phenomena and using them. It would look nothing like the way that civilization looks today. It could you, you could not sustain today's world the way it operates if if telepathy was well accepted. Yes. You mentioned um, a couple of really good points. You mentioned meditation. I think meditation is a particularly good example of the intersection of science and spirituality because it started as a spiritual practice yep. and then following scientific research into it and exploration, it became a main, mainstream because we have now evidence that it is beneficial for your health, it reduces stress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I see meditation as, as a very interesting point that brings these two parts together. Well, it's it's the the opening of minds as a result of converging practices, meditation, yoga, psychedelics, interest in consciousness from lots of different academic disciplines. Absolutely. So should we be teaching, as I call it, quantum magic in schools? What do you think? I think children are actually very open to these kinds of phenomena because they don't have all the prejudices that, that adults gather. Uh, should it be taught in schools? Well, I don't know. Uh, it, it may require a certain degree of maturity to understand it where a child may not have the concepts to be able to hold it all together. Uh, on the other hand, once we understand something to, to any degree, a good teacher will be able to convey elements of that to almost anyone who's able to pay attention for any length of time. So I've always thought it would be very interesting to have a school for gifted and talented children who actually had natural talents in this domain, because oftentimes they do. Yeah. And they learn as they get older to not talk about them. Don't talk about this stuff. Well, what a pity that is. I mean, we're, we have natural shamans walking around out there who 
could actually help us solve problems that would would benefit from uh, super intuitions and clairvoyance and precognition, all of that. It would be a very valuable source of uh, of currency in a sense. It's like human capital that we're not taking advantage of because there's a taboo. Well, this is a silly taboo. We should we should be mature enough yes. to be able to embrace the possibility that, yeah, you could train children from very young age to feel comfortable with these kinds of things. And then as adults, they would they would use them. Yes. A moment ago, you talked about telepathy being or being seen as a threat, if you like, by you know by government, by business, etc. Because basically, then yeah. there would be no secrets. <laughs> well, we do have remote viewing, yeah, which is a fairly strongly, as I understand, based or or promoted or explained in science. I mean, there is obviously still the element of well, we don't really know how this works. But governments use remote viewing in their various, various secret programs with various degrees of success. And, and there is a lot of literature about it already in books and articles and people coming forward confirming. So what is your take on remote viewing? Remote viewing is just a euphemism for clairvoyance or perception through space and time. That's all it is. So there's there's a ton of evidence for clairvoyance in many different forms. Remote viewing is just a uh, a modern or more modern way of doing that kind of a task. So in the in the early days with J.B. Ryan at Duke University, they would use cards. So cards with special symbols on it, and you would you would guess what the symbols were using clairvoyance or telepathy or precognition. And so that evidence was pretty good. There's there's uh, 40 years of evidence of people using cards. Overall, it's quite clear that some people are quite good at this task, but even for people who are not particularly good, there's so much evidence for it that it's clear that it's a real phenomenon. It also turns out to be really, really boring as a task. <laughs> so in the around the 1970s, a, a new method was developed called free response. So your target that you're trying to describe is a picture somewhere else, and you have no idea what the picture is, and so you draw it. And so this is where the notion of remote viewing came about, to a way of mm -hmm. just a freehand drawing whatever comes to mind. And then a scientific method was developed to evaluate that in a rigorous way. So that's that's the difference between card guessing, which is quite old now as a technique, versus a more modern way of doing it, which is more engaging for people and also much more accurate than than doing card guessing. Yes. And I found it uh, find it really interesting that remote viewing is promoted as a is specifically promoted as a non clairvoyance or an and as non psychic phenomenon. And in fact in various instructions and, and books those teachers say that in fact you need to not use or not allow yourself to go into the clairvoyant state of thinking and feeling and focus only on the numbers and coordinates and and the and the technicalities of the process yeah they're actually denying that this is clairvoyance but that that's historically inaccurate mm. it, it is precisely clairvoyance it's just a technique it's a layered technique on top of it yeah. to make it seem more technical and so the this notion and the words came about as a result of the government program that was using this. They, they didn't yeah. want to say they're doing psychic anything <laughs> or clairvoyance or whatever. They said, here's a training method, which is very precise, and we can train soldiers how to do this, and it has nothing to do with psychic phenomena. Well, sorry, but it is. It's exactly clairvoyance. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Dean, I've got as my final question – and this conversation has been absolutely fascinating and and I wish we had more time. <laughs> uh, but I've got as a final question and sort of an existential question for you. Is there an end point to what we can discover and learn about the nature of creation and its laws? In other words, how life really works. Or is it an ever-evolving and self-creating process? 
which cannot be predicted or quantified. What are your thoughts? Is there is there an endpoint? No. And and the the, the example I like to use is that uh, when I talk to my dog about quantum mechanics, he looks very interested and quite serious because he knows I'm talking to him. But what does he understand about what I'm talking about? So in the same sense, when when we try to use the best that we can by any means, psychic, mystical, rational, scientific, to understand the nature of reality that we're in, it's like talking to my dog about quantum mechanics. I, I really think that humans in our current form are not capable of understanding much more. I mean, no, I take it back. We, we can understand a lot more than we currently do. Mm-hmm. But can we get to a point where we say, okay, we finally understand it all? No, yeah. I don't think so. Yes, that, that's what I thought. Well, we have covered uh, quite a lot of ground here, even in this limited time. And of course, we have only scratched the surface. Is there anything you would like to add or as a final comment or message you would like to leave our audience with? One of the things that uh, influenced me to uh, pursue this as, as a, a vocation uh, was something that Joseph Campbell used to say when when people asked him, well, what do you, you know, what, what should I do as a student? And his response was to follow your bliss, which means find out what you're passionate about. It could be anything, provided it's not harming other people. Find out what you're passionate about and figure out a way of doing that as your profession. And then you'll never work a day in your life. And so I, that's kind of what I've done. I found I'm really I'm passionate about this. I'm very curious about these phenomena. And I get paid for doing this work. And so I, it, so the downside of it is I get paid for doing what I want, but then I end up doing it all the time. So it's difficult to disengage. So my wife is always saying, you know what, take a vacation, take a couple of weeks off. And I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm having so much fun doing this. Why would I take a vacation? I, all I would end up doing is taking my computer with me somewhere else and then keep continuing to work on it. So... Yeah, but that's that's a downside of following your bliss too much because then you know, well, what's wrong with being in bliss all the time? I don't know. Maybe nothing. <laughs> what a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, point to uh, end this conversation on. Thank you so much, Dean, for uh, for being on Quantum Living, and I'm sure that our listeners will enjoy this conversation as much as I have. And it's been such a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you. It's my pleasure as well. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.